Hi, my name is Frank Wagner. I am one of the pastors at Holy Spirit Lutheran Church in Juneau Beach, Florida, and it is my pleasure to uh, present this new series to you uh, called In the Meantime. It's a very exciting series, and I think it is very relevant to our walk as followers of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm actually presenting a series that was produced by North Point Resources. The speaker is Andy Stanley, who is the pastor of North Point Community Church. We are going to be looking at the series for the next six weeks. Today is week number one. But before we get started, let's open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, being followers of Jesus Christ isn't easy. Actually, it's often uh, a difficult struggle, very challenging. And as Christians, as Christ followers, we have certain expectations. One of those expectations is that when life is difficult, um, we expect Jesus to be there. We expect Jesus to hear our prayers, uh, to respond to our needs, uh, to make life uh, easier or more pleasant or whatever the, the circumstance happens to be. And it doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't always seem uh, as if Jesus is listening and doing something. And that's what this series is all about, um, that Jesus often appears to be silent to us or that he doesn't seem to care or that he's busy doing other things and I'm not his highest priority. Uh, we interpret his silence in so many different ways. So this series is very relevant because we all as Christ followers, go through this. So I pray that through the work of your Holy Spirit that uh, each one of us who um, participates in this series will be blessed, will receive a gift from it, that our faith, our relationship with Jesus Christ will grow. So Holy Spirit, come now into uh, this time of teaching and, and learning. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the way that this works is that uh, we use this series called In the Meantime here in our church for various Zoom uh, meetings, gatherings, um, but so that it can be made available to you whenever you have time. Uh, we tape it, we film it, and uh, we put it on our website, and then you can grab it and use it whenever it's helpful to you. So Use it as often as you can. Send it to other people if you think that they would benefit from it as well. But I want to make sure that you understand we didn't create any of this. This comes to us from North Point Resources that you can go to directly. In fact, go to northpointresources.com and then do a search for Anthology. And when you get to Anthology, you're going to see that North Point Resources has dumped a lot of resources, uh, videos, and study guides there for free. And you can just take it right from there for you to use. So you'll get the video and you'll get the discussion guide. And you can use that with your friends as much and as often as you want. What I'm always going to do is open with prayer. I'm going to have an, some introductory comments. Then I'm going to show the video to you. Today's video is about 18 minutes long. And then we'll have some closing comments. So let's get started with some opening uh, comments. Um, have you ever felt, you personally, have you ever felt or experienced uh, God being silent? In other words, uh, you prayed, you asked, you cried out for help or wisdom or guidance or comfort, strength. You, you prayed a sincere prayer and it seems as if hours, days, weeks, months, maybe longer went by and it's, it's as if you heard nothing from God, that God didn't do anything. And you interpreted that silence in ways that um, didn't help your faith, didn't strengthen your faith. You, you thought God's silence meant he didn't care. You thought he um, was absent, that, um, that there was something wrong with you, that uh, your faith wasn't strong enough or that you hadn't been good enough or whatever. All kinds of crazy thoughts come to mind and we just don't feel God doing anything about our circumstance. That's what this video is for. So have you ever felt that way? Um, I know that I certainly have. And I would encourage you to, to think on it because that will help this series to really benefit you. Um, I'll give you an example out of my own life. 
um, 27 years ago. I was in a wonderful church over in St. Petersburg, Florida. I uh, was blessed to be a part of that congregation. Um, I was married to my wife, Martina, and we had three beautiful kids, and they loved that congregation. They were very happy in their schools. So life was good for us. We were very fulfilled. And we suddenly received uh, from the National Church Office an opportunity to go to California and to start a brand new church. In other words, there was a, uh, a community with no uh, Lutheran church present. And they invited me to be part of a team to do that. <clears throat> and after a lot of thought and prayer, we accepted um, to join that team. What that meant was selling our home, leaving our wonderful church, taking our kids out of all of their social groups and out of their school, and move to California and start something totally new. Well, to make the story much shorter, it didn't work out. Um, what we were hoping didn't happen. And lots of reasons for that, but it didn't happen. And as I saw that coming, I prayed and prayed and um, I talked to God and say, why would you have me come out to California, leave the beautiful setting that we were in, uproot my family, put them through all of this chaos? Why would you do that? And then to have the whole thing in the end fail. And I really didn't understand. I truly felt the silence of God. I didn't feel God responding me or reassuring me or anything like that. So it, the ministry ended, and I was very blessed by God to be able to end up here back in Florida at um, Holy Spirit Lutheran Church, where I have now been for 25 years. But boy, did I quickly learn uh, within a year, within two years after having been in California and now being here, how much I had learned and how much I had grown and new skills that I had developed, um, new confidence, um, all kinds of things that grew out of that California experience. So what appeared in some ways to be a failure ended up being a huge blessing. But first I had to go through that time of silence. And um, now I see that God was really up to something amazing. Um, why do you think that some people will interpret God's silence as absence or apathy? Why do you think that when people aren't getting answers to their prayers, when you perhaps are not getting answers to your prayers, do we tend to interpret that as God not caring or God just not being anywhere around? And I think quite often one of the explanations is that we have expectations of God, that we expect God to answer within a certain amount of time and we expect him to answer in a certain kind of way. And that's, when that doesn't happen, that's what we understand to be silence and absence and apathy. And what I learned in my California experience is that was not true at all. I just needed to learn that God can be fully present in a different kind of way. Is there a different explanation for God's silence? And the answer is absolutely yes. But we need to grow into that. We need to learn that and experience that. Perhaps you yourself have seen someone who was going through a very difficult struggle and they were agonizing over the, uh, the situation. But in the midst of that agony, in the midst of that struggle, they had rock solid faith. They believed wholeheartedly that God was with them and that God was going to get them through this and that good would come out of it. And you were amazed at their faith and their ability to have such a strong relationship with God in the midst of the hardships. Probably what was going on is that their understanding of silence or their understanding of God's presence was much broader than yours. And probably they learned that by also going through times where they experienced God's silence and didn't understand that he was present, but they learned that he was. So I invite you now to watch this video segment uh, that you are about to see from uh, Pastor Andy Stanley, and then I will join with you for some closing comments afterwards. So enjoy the video.
And today, real quickly, I wanna go to two very familiar stories um, that you know kind of basically if you grew up in church, one may, you may know more than the other. And I simply wanna touch on these. I don't wanna go deep into these stories. I don't wanna read you the whole stories. But in both accounts, and I did this on purpose, these are two accounts with Jesus, two people that Jesus knew and that Jesus loved, and he kind of set them up for the kind of thing that many of us are experiencing right now where you think, God, where are you? Do you love me? Do you know my name? Do you care? You know, give me a sign, you know, throw me a line. I just, I just need to know that you're present in the midst of these circumstances. They don't, don't seem to be changing. And maybe there's no hope for them to change. The, the, first, one, the first one is John the Baptizer. Now, you, some of you know this story, some of you don't. The thing about John the Baptizer, he's John the Baptist, but that doesn't mean he's Baptist, it means he baptized. So it really it's John the Baptizer is how he got that nickname. That you can't really understand the significance of the story unless you read the Bible with your map. So real quickly, I wanna tell you the story, then I wanna show you a map because it illustrates, it illustrates this very point. Um, one day Jesus is teaching in Galilee to some of his core guys and he's about to send them out and a group of fellows walk up and they say, Jesus, we have a question. And he, they say, um, Jesus, we are John the Baptist's disciples. You know, you got your disciples, John the Baptist has his. And John the Baptist has sent us to you and he wants us to ask you this question, and then we're gonna go back and give him your answer. And the question is, check this out, you're, the question is, are you really Jesus? Are you really the Messiah? Are you really the sent one from God? Are you really the one we've all been waiting on? John wants to know. Now, how many of you, because you've heard this story before and you grew up in church, how many of you, where, let me just ask you this way, why didn't John ask the question himself? Where was John? That's right, he was in prison. John the Baptist is in prison. And the reason John the Baptist is in prison is he started, take, he started taking shots at some political people in his era. He, he worked up and he kind of did his ministry up and down the, um, the Jordan River. And uh, there was a king of that area, his name was King Herod. It was, it was the son of the King Herod that slaughtered all the babies in Bethlehem from the Christmas story. This is his son, King Herod. His name was Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas had a brother named Herod Philip because the first King Herod named everybody Herod. In fact, there was a niece named Herodias. Everybody was a Herod, okay? It was some kind of ego thing. So anyway, so Herod Antipas is the king, and his brother Herod Philip married their niece. Okay, you gotta follow this. So Herod, Herod Philip, who's the brother of the king, marries their niece. Now that's kind of weird, we don't even do that in the south, okay? So he marries his niece, all right? <laughs> Marries his niece, and then time goes by, and he goes to Rome for an extended trip, and while he's in Rome, his wife, niece, has an affair with his brother, her other uncle, okay, which is confusing, because it's like, uncle, I mean, honey, I mean, honey, uncle, I mean, whatever, you know, it's kind of confusing. So she has an affair with Herod Antipas, the king, and when Herod Philip gets back into town, they've gotten married, eventually they get married. So she's left one uncle for the other, okay? This is very confusing. So anyway, so um, this is like a big scandal and everybody knows about it and there's no magazines, you know, or no tabloids, but everybody knows. And so John the Baptist, this is very disturbing in any culture, but especially in Jewish culture. So John the Baptist, in part of his preaching and talking about sin and repentance, keeps using Herodias and King Herod as examples. And King Herod thinks it's kind of funny. Herodias, she didn't think it's funny. So she gets her new, you know, husband, uncle to have John the Baptist arrested and thrown in prison and thrown in the dungeon, but not just any dungeon. She has him sent to the easternmost part of the kingdom out in the desert at a place called Machaerus. It's the, his, um, one of his palaces on this, this hilltop out in the desert in Machaerus. And so John the Baptist is put in prison and he's left there. And time goes by and time goes by and time goes by. So he begins to have what we have when time goes by and nothing changes. He begins to have doubts. Now here's the interesting thing. Jesus loved John the Baptist. In fact, John the Baptist, remember, nobody knew who Jesus was. Everybody knew who John the Baptist was. And John the Baptist one day is baptizing and he sees Jesus and he stops. And he says, okay, you've been following me. That's the guy to follow right there. I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist announced Jesus. John the Baptist's mother and, and Jesus' mother were somehow relatives. They were somehow all distant cousins. In fact, here's what Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said, truly I tell you, among those born of women, now this is a big statement. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the greatest man on earth. That's what Jesus said. How would you like Jesus to say that about you? 
John the Baptist is the greatest. John, I mean, Jesus is like greater than your own father. Yes, greater than my own father. Greater than your mother. Yeah. John the Baptist is the greatest person on the planet. That's what Jesus thought of John the Baptist. But now John the Baptist isn't sure about what he thinks of Jesus. And here's why. Because when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, now, now, let, let me just say this before I show you this first real quick. Let me go ahead and put the first part up here. Look, this is amazing. When Jesus heard that John had been in, put in prison, now what comes next? If I was making up a story, I would not have put this in here. If, if, the, new, if the New Testament is fictitious, if the gospels don't really record what happened, if somebody's just making this whole story up to get us to believe something, you would not have put this in here. This next part, the only reason it's in the Bible, the only reason it's in the New Testament is because this is what happened. And the New Testament tells us what happened. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are reliable witnesses of what happened in the life of Jesus. Because if you were trying to get people to think Jesus was a great guy, you would not have included this. When Jesus, this is way before the guys came to ask Jesus about John the Baptist. When, John, when Jesus first heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison, what do you think he did? What, visited? Maybe sent him a care package? Send him a cake? Maybe send his disciples down there to Machaerus to visit? Maybe send him some loaves and fish? Maybe broke him out? Maybe send him, maybe turn Herodias into a loaf and fed her to the fish? I mean, he could have done that, you know? I mean, Jesus can do miracles. I mean, what do you think Jesus, the Son of God, does with one of his relatives, the guy that announced he was coming to the planet, the guy that announced that he's the savior of the world, the guy that Jesus thinks is the greatest person on earth? What do you think Jesus did when he heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum. Now, if you're reading your Bible, you're like, oh, that's interesting, keep on reading. This is a really big deal they should not, Matthew should have never told us this. And here's why, let me show you the map. You gotta have a map to get, get this. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he was right up here in the area of Nazareth. John the Baptist kind of worked this stretch of the uh, Jordan River, and when he was arrested, they put him out here in the desert in Machaerus. So when Jesus hears that John the Baptist has been arrested and put in Machaerus, you think he would have gone down here and visited him, or you know, said something, or tried to get him out, or gone before King Herod, and you know, I mean, this is his relative, this is, his, this is an important guy, this is the greatest guy on the planet. But the scripture tells us, Matthew tells us, and Matthew who was there said that Jesus withdrew and went to Capernaum. I mean, he could have stayed here, I mean, it's far enough away. Jesus went in the opposite direction. This is how you feel. This is how we feel. We're in the desert and you're up north of the lake. Hello, could you at least give me a visit? Send me a letter. Bake me a cake. Let me know you care. Now, it gets worse, all right? Did you know that you can get on a, on a, a jet? This is probably the best time of, you know, the season in the history of Israel to go over there and visit, but you could. You could get on a jet. You could fly over there. You can go down to the Nile, to the, Nile, to the Jordan River, cross the river, which is really dangerous right now, but you could. You could get across at night with some guides and some guns, and you could actually go visit you can go visit Machaerus, and when you visit Machaerus, you can see the hilltop where Herod had his palace. Since you're not gonna go, here's a picture, all right? You see this little road right here? It goes around the back. So this is the hilltop fortress where Herod had his palace, Machaerus. Here's the view from the palace. It's kind of beautiful if it's air conditioned. Here's the view from Capernaum. Jesus is at the beach. Jesus is sitting out under a cabana somewhere. <laughs> Jesus and his guys, they're hanging out. John the Baptist is in the desert dungeon. And he had been there over a year, probably closer to a year and a half, when he finally has had enough. And he calls the guys in who are bringing him food. See, in the dungeon, they didn't feed you. You just had to have friends to bring you food. If you didn't have friends to bring you food, you just starve there. There's no date. There's no court date. There's no trial. You're just in the dungeon until they remember that they need to do something with you or they need your room. So about a year and a half later, he finally, because he keeps hearing these rumors about Jesus, 
And he's like, what about me? I mean, have you forgotten your, you know, your buds, your cousin? You know, our moms know each other. You remember that thing where I announced you? You know, I, you know. So he sends these guys. And a year and a half after he's been wasting away in the desert, Jesus is up there under a palm tree and they find him in Capernaum where he moved in. And they say, hey, John has a question. Are you, are you really Jesus? Are you really the one? Should he be looking for another one? I mean, he's beginning to have his doubts and dude, we're not gonna tell him about all this, okay? Because he's already discouraged. <laughs> and Jesus says, yeah, here's what I want you to tell John. I want you to tell him I am the one. I want you to tell him about all the things I'm doing for everybody else. I want you to tell him about all the people I've healed. I want you to tell him about the lame walk and the blind see. I want you to tell him that prisoners have been set free figuratively. Well, maybe you shouldn't tell him that. I want you to tell John that, yeah, yeah, you, you can keep believing in me. Tell him because of all the things I'm doing for everybody else. And there is our life, isn't it? The reason I tell you that is because when you're hanging out in Macaris and you're wondering where Jesus is, Jesus can still love you. And Jesus can know exactly where you are and Jesus can know your name and not love you any less and not be any less active in your life. He did it for John the Baptist, the greatest man on the planet. And he can and he may be doing that for you. Now here's the fascinating thing. This is why I love to read the Bible. Right after these guys leave, to go back to tell, give John the message. Jesus says the most interesting thing. Here's what he said. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. This is a powerful, powerful statement. This is an admission of guilt. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. In other words, blessed is the one who does not interpret my silence as absence. Blessed is the one who when I do certain things or don't do certain things or don't answer certain prayers or don't come through or don't speak or don't change circumstances, blessed is the person that trusts me and believes in me and follows me in spite of me. Blessed is the person that con continues to trust me even when I don't seem to be acting on their behalf, just like John the Baptist. In other words, don't interpret God's silence is absence. Jesus knew all about John. Your heavenly father knows all about you. You can bank on it. The other story, the only reason I bring up this next one, this is a really familiar story, but what's cool to me is it actually happened right in the spot where John the Baptist used to baptize. So some time goes by, John the Baptist is either still in prison or maybe he's already died. He's been beheaded because of Herod beheaded John the Baptist. He, he never was released, he never was set free. And so in the very spot where John the Baptist used to baptize, Jesus shows up and he begins teaching and people who had heard John preach and teach said, this guy is amazing. This is the guy that John the Baptist told us about. Has anybody seen John? Well, anyway, you know, this is the very guy that John the Baptist told us about. And whereas John never did miracles, this guy does miracles. I mean, he is like the guy, you know, this is amazing. So Jesus is teaching there and he's sitting around one day and a man runs up out of breath and he says, master, <clears throat> catch my breath. Lord, the one that you love is sick. Now think about this. If somebody walked up to you or ran up to you and said, hey, the one that you love has just been in a car accident, who would you think of? Well, you know, if you have kids, you'd start with your kids because they didn't say the one that loves you, it's just the one you love, okay? So the one that you love, and then they'll love you eventually, okay? The one that you love, or you might think of your husband, or you might think of your wife, but if somebody walked up to you and said, the one that you love is sick, I mean, that's a really small circle of people. So this guy doesn't even use a name. He says, the one that you love is sick. Now, who is he talking about? Who knows, who is he talking about? Yeah, Lazarus. That's right. I heard it down here on the front, and I heard it at Buckhead Church in the balcony. That's great. Yeah, Lazarus, okay? He, he knew it was Lazarus. Now, this is what's so interesting. J Jesus loved Lazarus so much, all they had to say was, the one that you love is sick. So what would you expect Jesus to do when he finds out someone he loves is sick? I mean, come on, strangers touched Jesus and they were healed. Jesus healed all kinds of people, didn't know their names, didn't know their stories, didn't know if they were sick because of something they had done. I mean, he just healed all kinds of people. Now somebody he actually knows is sick. Now, Jesus loved Martha, that's Lazarus' sister, and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, in fact, when you read the story in John 11, it's interesting, all the guys get up, Jesus says, sit back down. 
Aren't we going? Jesus says, no, we're not going. We're going to wait. But the one you, I, I know he's sick. What are we, we're going to stay here. Why? Because I'm up to something you don't understand. God's going to do something nobody anticipates. Lazarus can handle it. Mary and Martha can handle it. They're going to hate me. And they did. They're going to be mad at me. And they were. They're going to misunderstand me. And they did. They're going to judge me. And they did. Jesus said, it's okay. Sit back down. And Lazarus got sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. And he died and Jesus knew his name. And he loved him. Don't confuse God's apparent absence for apathy. Now, this, is, this message isn't like, oh, I'm so glad you told me that. I feel so much better. I don't even need to come to the rest of the series. I'm like, I'm good to go. No. I just want to, this is important, I just want to create a category for you to understand that your unanswered prayer does not mean God is uninterested. I mean, you and John the Baptist have something in common. You and Mary and Martha and Lazarus have something in common. You and some of the finest people who have ever walked on the planet and some of the people that God has used in the most unique way, you have something in common. And God's silence is not, an ev is not evidence of absence and his apparent absence is not a reflection of apathy. And how do we know that? Because of the story of John the Baptist and the story of Lazarus and the story of others. There is a category where we feel abandoned and we're not abandoned. There is a category, there are seasons of life when God seems silent and still and he is neither silent nor still. But I love these words. Jesus said, blessed is he, blessed is she who does not stumble, who does not lose their faith on account of me. So I hope you enjoyed the video presentation by Pastor Andy Stanley. And I want to remind you, if you would like to be able to have the study guide, that all you need to do is go to northpointresources.com, uh, look at the anthology link, and there you will find the study guide for in the meantime. So what were your thoughts? When you heard Pastor Andy Stanley talk about um, that text in, from Matthew chapter 11, where he says, there is John the Baptist out in the desert in prison for over a year and a half, <clears throat> and Jesus has gone actually in the opposite direction up to Lakeside, and Pastor Andy Stanley interprets it this way. There's John the Baptist in prison in the desert, and where's Jesus? He's sitting at the beach. How did you feel about that? What were your thoughts? Have you perhaps at times felt that way too? That you were crying out to Jesus to come be part of your prison experience? And the feeling that you got was that Jesus was somewhere else sitting underneath an umbrella at the beach. Have you ever felt that God was at the beach while you were in the desert? Think on that. You are not alone in that. I would venture to say that every Christ follower has had that very same feeling or experience, that they have felt very much alone and felt that when they reached out to Jesus Christ, whom they believed in, that he would be more responsive. Andy Stanley says to us that what we need when we're feeling that way is perhaps a new understanding, a new category of how Jesus can be fully present with us even when we experience nothing but his silence. That it is possible that when we are going through a struggle and feel that Jesus is absent or doesn't care, that what's really going on is that he deeply cares and he is firmly present. But in our definition of that, we're not experiencing it. And so Andy Stanley is saying what he wants to do is to create a broader understanding, a new category of how Jesus is present. So I'd ask you this question. When you're in the desert, when you're going through this difficult time of life, how are you experiencing God? Where would you say that Jesus is? 
how would you describe your relationship? If you would describe it as distant or empty, um, if you would say that it is inadequate and it is not fulfilling, perhaps what you need, perhaps what you are seeking, is a new category, a new understanding of how God, through Jesus Christ, is truly present. Your unanswered prayer does not mean that Jesus is absent. Your unanswered prayer doesn't mean that Jesus is apathetic. Your answered prayer simply means that you don't understand what Jesus is up to because his promise is that he is always with us and that he is working the situation for our good. Would you please join with me in our closing prayer? Lord Jesus, this is such an important lesson for each and every one of us. It is the beginning of a six-week journey that we will do together. I pray, Lord, that you can create within us new categories of understanding of how you care, that nothing is more important to you than us and our lives together with you, and that especially in times of deep concern or times of struggle or loneliness or fearfulness, that you are with us and that you are working that situation for our good if we will surrender it to you. So on behalf of everyone who is watching this video, help us, Lord, to grow in our understanding and as well help us to surrender our struggles and challenges to you so that you can work them to good for us. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I hope that you have benefited from this first lesson and I look forward to um, having a conversation with you or a presentation with you for lesson two. God bless you.